I'm Eddie Knox, and this is The Skinny. From the Batheads Eyewear Studios in Speedway, Indiana, this is The Skinny. Brought to you by Toyota, Rhino Classifieds, General Tire, and Dream Giveaway. This segment of The Skinny is brought to you by Toyota. Once again, we'd like to welcome you back to the skinny. It is a nasty day outside here in Speedway, Indiana, just about 10 minutes or so from the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, and we're bringing on a guest that is in beautiful southern sunny California, I believe, and uh, he's a longtime friend, excels in motorsports for sure, no matter what it is that he's been part of. He has won. He has set records. He's been involved as a driver, as a team owner. Uh, as a as a lead mechanic, a little bit of everything all along the way, but the one thing that has been consistent is his success inside of this motorsports industry. His name is Eddie Knox, Fast Eddie Knox. He works at the Fun Factory. I mean, can you can you imagine having a better place to go to work at than the Fun Factory? We're going to focus on the racing stuff here in a minute, my friend, but uh, we got to get things off in the right direction here because and talk about what's really serious. How did you shoot this morning on the golf course? Well, unfortunately, sunny Southern California was a little chilly and about 35 mile an hour winds. So I skipped it. Uh, he just didn't go at all. I know you guys are fair weather golfers out there in, in Southern California. We'll play down to 43 degrees, but when the wind comes up, that's a little brutal. Yeah, the, the wind uh, is brutal for sure. We have a nasty day here. I mean, we've had actually a really good winter uh, in terms of temperature, but yeah, we've got our fair share of uh, heavy rain, wind today. It's in the lower 40s, just one of those miserable dark winter days. Uh, that time of year here in Indianapolis. Yeah, you guys can keep that stuff way back there. <laughs> hey, man, thanks for finding the time and, and jumping on here. We've had a pretty diverse group of uh, players on this show, uh, the best of the absolute best all along the way, and you certainly fall inside of that category. Um, I, I was going back through some of the stuff that, you know, that, that I managed to keep all along the way, and, of course, your championships. I, I, I don't remember exactly what it is off the top of my head. I want to say four top fuel hydro championships, but – uh, as I started looking at some of the performances, I had to go back much farther than I thought. I had to go back to um, the end of 2009. I think 2010 is when we went to 1,000 foot with the drag boat series. But going back to the end of 2009, when it was all said and done, it was some guy by the name of Daryl Ehrlich who had the quickest quarter mile pass of, of uh, all time. Um, at a 452.4 inside of some boat called the Problem Child. So unless they plan on bringing the quarter mile back for Top Fuel Hydro, I say that one stands in infamy. Yeah, that's pretty cool. We retired those records, and uh, I can't remember if we had the mile an hour as well, but we were just really hitting our stride when uh, we teamed up with Daryl that year and uh, obviously went on to do pretty good together. Uh, I don't remember what happened. I think they got rid of the thousand foot as well. So not sure where they're at now. Yeah, I agree. I think they went to 875 if I'm not mistaken. But yeah, I do have uh, you guys actually, to be honest with you, in terms of the record, I had Ron McClellan holding the record at a 458 too. That was, you still had to back it up. But you guys had the quickest and fastest pass, 452.4, 260.98. Uh, both set uh, at the World Finals in 09, one in round two, one in round three. So, uh, and fastest, I still have you guys at 265.52. So, um, pretty pretty amazing. I mean, that was quarter mile days. It was that was nuts. Yeah, I think half the problem was trying to stop them. You know, we had three big uh, parachutes back there, and sometimes it still just got you right to the edge, and they. They decided to shorten the course. Uh, mainly, they thought it would save money, which was kind of pretty funny. It just shortened the fuse, is all it did. Yeah, I've often we've had this discussion with our with our team owner in uh, UTVs, who actually is a super switched on guy. Anytime they make a rule change and and they say it's going to save people money, it <laughs> that, ne that that never <laughs> quite works out. <laughs> No, it sure doesn't. You know, it actually made them more dangerous, if you ask me, because we had to have a lot more energy in them in the first part of the track. 
And uh, that's where, you know, you're at peak velocity. So when things go wrong, it goes wrong. Yeah, you know, you say that. And, and as we went forward and, and got into the 1,000-foot stuff, I'm looking at the end of, of 2016. Uh, I actually have you guys holding six out of the top ten uh, quickest passes in the 1,000-foot mark, including the quickest at a 336. Um, that was at, at the end of 2016. And then you also had uh, eighth mile. You guys had the quickest eighth mile Dwayne Patton, of course, that number has always been there. We've had that discussion before, but uh, at a 244, and, and we thought there was some stuff there that, that maybe was a miscue, but uh, you guys right behind him at 246, I mean, after everything was said and done. So you speak of that energy, that early on energy, and that is something that you for sure focused on. Yeah, we, uh, you know, we changed up the gears a little bit and a uh, little different size propellers and such, but um, you just had to have the perfect set of what we called magic slippers on it to get it moving before she uh, actually got hooked up and started throwing the boat around. Uh, when we landed it, it was a thing of beauty. And when we didn't, you know, it was, uh, it was pretty ugly. So, uh, so help the fans out there, as uh, I'm sure they will start Googling some top fuel hydro passes, and they should Google the, uh, the problem child because it was nothing short of spectacular to watch that boat go. When you guys were on your game there, uh, those few years, you just kind of had it sorted out. You had it in its happy place. Uh, it would do, which the guys here were already making fun of me whenever I w we would call them wheel stands, and they're like, is it a wheel stand or a prop stand? I said, well, we always called it a wheel stand. I said, but technically, I guess it is a prop stand, but uh, you guys got that thing sorted out, and, man, it would just yank that boat up out of the water, and it really would do a violent wheel stand to get going. Yeah, we, um, we actually called them wheelies, too. You know, didn't think much about it because we actually built wheelie bars for it. So I guess that goes hand in hand. But, yeah, to try to get the proper balance, you know, you're lifting a 3,500-pound boat uh, that's stuck to the water. So you have to lift it up, throw it out there, and then it splashes back down and locks the motor up. Well, that's quite a process when you don't have a, you know, clutch management system and such. And it really pulls the balls out of the motor. So what we tried to do was keep the wheels in the air as long as possible and try to get it to set down more like a feather and not scrub off any of that early speed. It, uh, it, was, amazing. it was an amazing time for me to be a part of the drag boat racing organization because uh, I was able to watch the dual prop, uh, the dual prop success happen. Uh, you know, I came in early enough where it was still a struggle, and then uh, and then Dwayne and those guys did a marvelous job of of really starting to connect the dots, and then you guys all started jumping on board, and that entire class changed. and And man, it was just I mean, I remember Shannon Stewart going, you know, four ninety six, and everybody was like, "Oh my God!" And by the time you guys got done with it, you're shattering stuff. Yeah, the, the dual props really, uh, it helped mainly in the engine department, the engine tuning. So we could burn a lot more fuel, a lot more blower boost with uh, two propellers hooking up. And to be honest with you, most people don't quite get it. You know, when you hit the throttle, the motor goes to about seven, 7,500. But when it lands, it pulls it down to five grand, um, sometimes lower. And those props hook up solid, like having six good years on there. And they don't let loose after that. So we have a very minimal time where they actually cavitate. But, boy, once they bite, I mean, they're gone. And, and when you look at it as opposed to the, the cars, you know, they've got to burn up a bunch of energy through the clutch before they can go one-to-one. -one. Well, we're one-to-one -one just past the starting line, and I think that's why they were so quick. Yeah, it was amazing. So you effectively added twice the grip. I mean, once you guys and, and I should I should make a point. Shannon Stewart going at four ninety six was with a single single prop effort, and then of course the dual props came in, and uh, you guys started figuring all that out. It changed the attitude of the boat. It changed how it launched. I mean, it changed everything that you guys did. Everything had to be thought thought through again to work the process out. Yeah, it was like starting all over again. Um, I didn't have a lot of experience with a single prop top fuel boat. I believe we were running top alcohol back then. 
but once we got into the duels and uh, to look at one of the propellers or maybe an inch and a quarter in diameter, uh, inch and a half if you're lucky and only half of that ear is in the water. So you can imagine the, the bite, you, would, you wouldn't think it's there, but boy, it moves some water. And that's why you see the crazy rooster tails. It's funny that you say that. To this day, I have a picture in my, uh, in my office of Dale Ishmaro, uh on what I would call a perfect attitude pass. The boat had already left. It had taken a set, single prop. Uh, but it is just literally riding on the tail end of the two sponsons. The whole back of the boat is up in the air. And you, I don't know, I'm, I'm not going to tell you I can see one ear of the prop, but it is exactly, as you said, a two-ear prop. One is in the water, one's out of the water. And I remember you guys explaining that to me, and I was like, you have got to be kidding me. That's, that's impossible. How is it that a boat can go that fast with one ear of the prop in the water? It's pretty crazy when you think about it. And uh, once the boat is up on plane, obviously the idea is to drag as, as little water as possible. Then she gets up on her high heels or tippy toes, like we used to say, and uh, it just starts churning. Those propellers are moving at about 23,000 RPMs. And the actual prop tip speed is somewhere, I don't know, near Mach 2 or so. So when they're done a run, those things have been heat treated and boiling water and glowing red like you wouldn't believe. Yeah, and I remember you guys, that a big part of the maintenance for those boats is checking all the underwater um, parts and pieces on those boats. They would bend the ears religiously. They would crack stuff and break stuff. And I remember the single prop guys they are single prop days. They would get one magical run out of it. The prop would be junk and they'd have to start all over again. And those were handcrafted props. So there were no two the same. Yeah, that's a true story. Even uh, with the advent of the CNC propellers, ultimately they have to have a little hand finishing. And uh, when you're running two of them, you really need a match set because um, like we said, the twin screw uh, made a lot more power and was safer in many ways. But if you had one propeller out of balance or broke one propeller in the run, well, then the thing would just corkscrew. And uh, we had that happen a couple times, unfortunately. He's one of the baddest men inside of the pits. Certainly knows how to set one up. We're going to take a break here in just a moment. We'll be back on the other side with more from Fast Eddie Knox. This segment of It's Skinny has been brought to you by General Tire. It's more than just a slogan. Anywhere is possible with General Tire. General Tire's Grabber X3 Mud Terrain Tire offers aggressive styling and is engineered for durability with innovative performance features that are ready to carry you through extreme mud, dirt, and rock-covered terrain. For extreme traction that's ready for anything and rugged styling to match, look no further than the Grabber X3. Make your anywhere possible by visiting GeneralTire.com today. segment of the skinny is brought to you by rhino classifieds tired of all those ads and random stuff that shows up when you're looking to buy or sell your car parts rhino classifieds was created just for you welcome to a streamlined buying and selling app created by racers for racers and race fans modified cars classic cars race cars that special big block you need the trailer to move your baby around the country in we got you at rhino.co. Welcome back to the skinny today. We have Eddie Knox on the show with us, certainly known for his, uh, his success in the drag boat racing industry was in it for many, many years. Also a lot of success as well inside of sand dragsters and now currently in nostalgia funny car running the problem child funny car as well. Thanks for joining us once again, Eddie. Hey, man, let's go back and, and tell me how this all began. When did, uh, when did the fascination for speed and cars, when did it begin? How young were you? Were your, was your father instrumental or your parents instrumental in, in getting you involved? Well, oddly enough, um, my father wasn't really an, a hot rod kind of guy. I mean, he did have a pretty cool 63 Malibu back in the day. But uh, we came from the East Coast, uh, Baltimore, New Jersey area, 
And when we moved to Southern California in the early 70s, it was like a different planet. You know, every it's sunny year round. There's dirt bikes in every uh, driveway. There's a, a flat bottom, maybe a race car. There was so much going on in the Southern California area back then. I mean, 15 minutes in every direction was a racetrack. And people raced boats, you know, Marine Stadium, Pomona, all the different uh, drag strips, off-road courses. There really was just racing going on or outdoor activity all the time. And so through friends, you know, uh, my dad didn't have a boat or anything particular like that. We didn't quite have dirt bikes yet, but uh, it seemed that a good portion of my friends did. And so when you're a kid and you go to their house and they got old old Sanger sitting in the driveway with a 392 Hemi in it and colorful paint jobs. It, it was just, you, you kind of got hooked immediately. And especially I was so new to it, you know, didn't really kind of have the lakes and rivers and such back there for this type of activity. And it didn't take long before I rode in one. And a little while later I drove one and Man, that was about it. You go to a boat race in the 80s or the 70s, and like literally it's just museum pieces. They are shiny and the, the most wild paint jobs. And it was easy to get hooked. No doubt in my mind, uh, nice, uh, a nice piece of information. I had no clue you originated in, in the East Coast. And living up there for a number of years with my wife, yeah, there's no real drag boat racing that's going on over there in that part of the world. So to go out there in Southern California where it just seems to be everywhere, if you guys are going to the river, just having a good time, somebody's got a fast boat out there that the, those guys are, are racing. Um, and not to mention the crowds, like you say, back in the day, and I only know from pictures, but uh, you had to watch the crowds, the girls that were out there. You as a, as a young man, I'm sure the ladies being everywhere and, and the, the shiny equipment and the boats, I mean, it, it had to be a circus atmosphere of fun. Yeah, it really was a good time. Um, I was uh, married through most of my drag racing, especially in the early early years. As a matter of fact, my son was conceived at the drag boat races. So <laughs> <laughs> we, our blood runs deep there. Uh, but it was great. I mean, literally, you can, if you live in the Southern California area, and I have a couple friends that do this, you can get up in the morning, go surfing, head up to Big Bear, get a half day ski ticket. On your way to the river, stop by, run your dirt bikes for a little bit, and then make it to Parker in time for the evening, you know, glass ski. Everything around us is an hour and a half away. So it's, it's other than, you know, it being California, it's a pretty great place to live. That I mean, that all sounds great in theory if you don't live out there, but we all know the only way you're getting anywhere out there in an hour and a half is if you leave at four in the morning. <laughs> yeah. Well, I see, I'm smart. Geographically, I moved right in the center of all the activities. I'm already in the desert. So it's an hour and a half to the beach, the mountains, or the river. So I'm in a pretty good spot. Yeah, that's great, man. That is great. So you got the bug, and, and uh, I didn't know you until after you really were uh, a co-owner and really tuner um, on, on the boat. But there was a time when you, were, you put the helmet on and you were behind the wheel. Yeah, uh, my fascination, as I explained earlier, as a kid, you know, it uh, eventually you, you work your way uh, to getting one. You know, so when I was, I don't know, probably uh, 21, I moved down here to the Palm Springs area started working at uh hadn't bought a boat yet 24 i got my first house and was smart enough or dumb enough to refinance it in a year and buy an aluminum chevrolet from uh, kirk coons who is now pro mod guy and uh got me a little flat bottom and took off to the river you know goofed off a little bit um after we got it up over 100 120 miles an hour it was time to go to a racetrack, an organized event with, you know, actual safety gear on and helicopters sitting there if they need you. You know, we were up uh, and it still goes on at the river. You know, you, you, your neighbor kicks your ass one day and next week you come out with a bigger blower and take him down. <laughs> Just kind of kind of went from there. I drove at flat bottoms and then uh, into blown gas hydro, had a pretty good run there, moved up to alcohol hydro for a few years and then eventually uh, 
after, I don't know, four or five years off of just tuning and building engines, uh, we built the first top fuel boat, uh, Larry Bless and I. Yeah, I, sc- <laughs> I scrunch. I see the videos all the time of the guys out there in the river with a flat, blown flat bottom and, I mean, stand on the throttle and a passenger alongside. And I guess I'm just getting a little old because I look at that and I scrunch. I've seen a lot of things go really wrong really quickly, and those boats are pretty finicky, man. It doesn't take much. So uh, God bless those guys, but I think I'll just stand on the shore and watch. Yeah, I'm with you now. I I cut all my daredevil activities back a long time ago. Um, Even the off-road toys, the hot boats at the river. All I want to drive now is a golf ball, and I'm pretty cruddy at that, so it's going to take a little (laughs) tuning work. There's nothing wrong with a with a pontoon boat here and there. (laughs) A a party 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 barge. So so let me ask let me ask you when did when did it make sense to you that, hey, man, I'm pretty good at this engine building thing. I'm pretty good at this engineering thing uh, to get a boat stable enough to run, you know, the the power that you guys produced. You clearly, it, it just makes sense to you. When I see people like you that, you know, that are so successful, uh, you connect all the dots. You think ahead. You think outside of the box. It just makes sense. But when did that start to click for you? I mean, clearly your father didn't get you into it, but you had to be around a circle of very talented people to become the engine builder and and really car builder, boat builder that you've turned into today. Well, I'll tell you, um, I didn't have an automobile till I was probably a senior, and it was a piece of junk orange Volkswagen. But my friends all had hot rods. And so I started kind of doing the tinkering on those. I was subscribed to every magazine, Hot Rod, you know, all that. Read all the articles, believe it or not. And as I I grew into it and a couple friends started running a bracket class with the boats, um, I was fortunate enough to uh, be around some pretty smart people. When I, uh, my first kind of job in boat racing was on a top fuel hydro and I changed the oil, you know, that sort of thing, nothing special. But I listened and paid attention. And literally the owner of the boat, his name was Ken Schmudluck, would be standing there talking to Keith Black, Joe Paisano, Gene Mooneyham. I mean, all of these people came out to the races in Southern California. And I just was like a fly on the wall, you know, I sort of paid attention. But I never grew up in a speed shop atmosphere, never in a paying engine builder job, anything like that. It was always mechanic and um, always pretty low budget deal. So we just couldn't go buy the shiniest new objects every time they came out. And it teaches you to take what you have and work with it and work with it, massage it and tweak it. And I think I've told you before, like squeezing the blood out of the rock. And so I tried a lot of things that were kind of just not standard, you know, and got a lot of funny looks. But after a while, I started making them work. And, you know, my mom always told me, you know, you keep throwing noodles against the wall. When one sticks, the pasta's done, right? So we just kind of did everything a little unordinary. And uh, same thing with the car. I'm just kind of taking my own approach with what I own and what I know. And uh, slowly it's coming around. So uh, are you a fan of, of where it's come to today? A lot of uh, computer involvement, all the sensors, you're able to really document fuel. And cl- now, obviously, uh, with the car, or I guess even with the boat, what the clutch is doing and, and all those segments versus old school when you guys didn't have near the control? Yeah, I'm still an old school guy, and I think that's why this nostalgia uh, heritage type car racing works for me. I know still barely know how to turn on a damn race pack. Uh, but with the boats, we were the same way. I'm not against, you know, every progress and everything that, that goes on. Um, I think it's a little funner looking at parts, spark plugs and tuning than you know, plugging in a little box and giving the tune up to your car. Um, but it is the way it is. You still have to be talented and smart, but I'm for old school, pull it apart, take a look at it, make some adjustments, go run it again. Walk around, let your hands get uh, get warm off the top of the pipe to see if the cylinder's firing. That's right, baby. You got to touch them. <laughs> <laughs> I burned a lot of hair off my hands doing that, but <laughs> never let it show. 
<laughs> I, that was always the coolest part. You watch guys like you walk around and, uh, uh, you know, no mask on, just hands over the top of the pipes, looking, listening, uh, taking it all in. And, and, of course, I was just like every, every other kid in the candy store, just in awe of watching you guys do what you do. Yeah, I'm more of a, a sound and smell and feel kind of guy. Uh, yeah, for many years, didn't wear a mask like a dumb... Oh, sorry. Um, but Amos Sattery taught me something later in life. He also talked me into running top fuel. It's his fault. But I asked him, well, why do you wear the, the earmuffs? And he had certain ones that he liked, and he wore them all the time. He goes, trust me, son, when you put these on, it will take out a lot of the noises that aren't necessary but it'll let you hear what is. And so I went, well, okay. Took me a few tries with the earphones and the mask and I went, I'll be damned, he's right. You know, it takes the, the sharp tones out and lets you concentrate on the more or less the innards of the engine. Yeah, I, I would uh, liken that to uh, an, an audio, a compressor. You know, we use compressors here and it'll take out the highs and the lows, but you can focus really on what you're trying to hear. So I, it makes perfect sense to me, but you wouldn't think of that. You wouldn't think of it unless somebody told you. Yeah. Amos, uh, he was a good old bird and probably one of the, the greatest natural tuners that we'll ever have seen in our lifetime. And strictly just from feel, smell, sound, he, he was awesome. And even he, uh, when we started talking about computers and we had on, one on the boat for a while there or data acquisition, basically what you call it. And uh, I'd ask him, you know, what does this thing do? And what does that do? And he's like, I don't know, son, it's just too much information. Unplug that damn thing and you'll be fine. And sure as hell, he was right again. <laughs> Famous Amos Satterley. Uh, boy, what a uh, what an honor it was to to meet and hang and, and watch that guy do what he did. Of course, with Speed Sports Special and uh, Lou and the gang over there, so talented as well. But... Famous, famous Amos was a guy to be around, man. He was a cool dude. He was quiet. You watch him go to work, and usually come Sunday evening, man, it wouldn't be, uh, wouldn't be a shocker to see him get in the saucer just a little bit and, uh, and enjoy his hard work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, he liked him a little whiskey, you know, at the end of the day. But uh, one of the biggest feathers, if, if you can call it that, in my cap, uh, one year at the awards banquet, you were probably emceeing it. Uh, there was a Lifetime Achievement Award for Amos Satterley. And I don't know, he may have had 25 to 30 championship jackets and boats alone and then his history with the cars. And when he got off the stage, I went over and hugged him and, and shook his hand. And I said, well, do you have any regrets, Pops? And we always called him Pops. He said, yeah, talking you into running top fuel. And that was the, <laughs> the greatest compliment I've ever had in my life. <laughs> that was great stuff, man. That's that's an awesome story. Yeah, you were kicking some ass. There's no doubt about it. And his ass was one of them you were beating up on there just a little bit. So I'm sure he enjoyed the rivalry. Hey, stay with us, man. We'll close things out here in the next segment. We'll be right back with more from Fast Eddie Knox. This segment of The Skinny is brought to you by Dream Giveaway. Dream Giveaway has been giving away high-end American muscle cars to raise money for charity since 2007. Dream Giveaway is known for giving away classic and new muscle and paying the federal taxes so the winners don't have to. For $25, you can jump in the game, and part of that goes to charity. You'll have a chance at winning some of the coolest cars on the planet. Check it out at dreamgiveaway.com. Once again, welcome back to The Skinny. We have Eddie Knox with us. He's joined us from beautiful Southern California. Breezy day out there, but still very nice to be out there and doing what he does. Has currently made the shift from drag boat racing over to nostalgia funny car racing. Again, the car called Problem Child, but the Camaro is phenomenal. You guys got started in that, uh, I believe, a couple of years ago now, maybe 2019 or so. 
and have already enjoyed some success. I know you set a record with it there early on. Um, uh, tell me about, about the car in the future. Well, the car is a blast. I got to tell you, I've never once raced an automobile in my lifetime. Never once driven up to a tree, not even my passenger car. So we simply know nothing about cars. Uh, so every day is a new experience. It's refreshed my brain, so to speak. I got my gears turning again. It's exciting. It's like the boat race and it's a lot of good people. Really heavy competition in this uh, Heritage Nitro cars. Um, they've all been doing it their whole life. You know, they're pretty good at it by now. So, but once in a while we give them a little chink here and there and uh, I'm learning every weekend. Uh, to give you an idea, the boat had a 110 gallon fuel pump on it. The car has 21 gallons. <laughs> so it's, it's not much to run on, but it makes you work really hard. It makes you think really hard how to get the most efficiency out of one of these things. And, um, it's kind of cool. You know, you're on the starting line, firing the cars up. You look across at the other crew chiefs. It might be Roland Leong. It might be some other, you know, famous guy. And, uh, that part's pretty fun. Uh, a lot of people ask me, you know, the difference, uh, well, one of them is with the boat, you know, you back them down to the water and you push them off and you give them a thumbs up and wish them good luck, you know, hope it starts, hope you make it. And then with the car, you know, you're standing right there in front of God and everybody, if it doesn't start, they know why. And so you're <laughs> a lot more involved. I mean, literally touching the car to up until the last seconds before it leaves. Yeah, I never thought of it that way. I mean, I guess you can easily just blame it on the driver if the boat doesn't start. <laughs> Every time. <laughs> That's great stuff. <laughs> if the trailer got a flat tire, it was the driver's fault. <laughs> Well, I'm sure that still applies every every opportunity you can squeeze it in, but uh, yeah, no, that's yeah. that's super cool, and and I I do realize that those huge names, legendary names, are out there that you're competing against. That has to be very exciting, and uh, like you say, you, you get a chink here, you get a chink there. It's kind of like your golf game, right? Every now and again, you you hit yeah. one, you're like, oh man, I can do this. So and, and you, you get one of those good runs, and and you come back and say, I right, we got a handle on this thing. Yeah, I just figured out half of my golf swing is like the car is shaking the tires. It doesn't go very far, and it hurts. <laughs> <laughs> you always equate it back well, to the race car, right? <laughs> yeah, it's really a great time. You know, again, growing up in Southern California, I went to a lot of races. And when you show up, and you, of course, you know, you see the, the snake and the mongoose, and all the cars had names on them, you know, and, and a theme. And it was pretty neat. And so this type of series we're in, it's pretty much the same way. Of course, you got Problem Child. You got a bunch of different ones. And there's some really cool names out there. And uh, the backup girls dress accordingly to the theme of the car. And uh, it's a lot of fun. And there's a lot of huge interest in it. Uh, the crowds we get at the uh, Famosa races or maybe up in uh, Boise, the other Firebird Raceway, the original Firebird Raceway, are incredible. You know, a lot of people still love this stuff. They remember it as a child, and they're all in walkers and canes and such. But, you know, they're still getting out there to see it. Well, and, and kudos to you guys for giving them something that would motivate them to come out to something like that. I mean, clearly, as you talk about the older crowd there, it's it's so easy to say, you know what, we've been there, we've done that, I have no interest in, in getting outside and doing something. But something like that is so emotional to them. It, it It's such a tie-in with their life that they want to come back out and, and watch you guys do what you do. And you're better for it. I mean, the cars are better than they've ever been, certainly better than they were back then, you know, originally. But to come out and watch them, I'm sure the show is much better as well because you guys have so much more figured out. So uh, I think it's a win-win all the way around. Yeah, and I'm real proud of what a great job uh, Billy has been doing driving the car. You know, he wasn't an asphalt guy either. And he's tremendous with the fans, with the sponsors, 
we have a great team. I couldn't be more proud of them. And it's that standpoint is pretty laid back in the pits. You know, I, I deal with the tension of the tuning. But other than that, the guys prep a good car. Billy's awesome with signing autographs, and he'll talk to anybody that, you know, has questions. And, yeah, we're enjoying it. It, it feels a lot like the boat races in that aspect. Um, but, you know, I mean, boat racing is pretty darn cool. You got a lot more bikinis there than you got this car <laughs> thing. So I'm trying – I got to school these guys how to run the pits a little better, but we're getting there. <laughs> You know, the boat races, uh, I said this for years, you know, a lot of my career was in short course off-road, and it is certainly a, a, a large passion of mine, but the, but the drag boat racing was always special, and, and you just touched on it for a moment, and not to go back down that road, but I, I just want to let the fans know, it, and I've always related it to a level of danger, I think. Uh, because the level of danger was higher, I, I always felt like the camaraderie itself was also higher. Everybody wanted to race and race each other hard, but in the drag boat world, and I'm, I'm sure it's the same in your world as well, but everybody would come to help everybody. And it just, it, there was just more of a, of a camaraderie, I felt like, in the drag boat pits than anywhere else I think I've ever been. You know, you do have a point, and we felt the same way, uh, especially when you started getting racing in the South and back East. Hospitality is immense. There's nothing they won't do for you. And I found that with boat racers, we had an open door policy on our trailer. If there was a racer who needed something and we had it, we were damn well going to loan it to them, if not help them put it on. You know, uh, the danger of the sport brings people really close together. And of course, you know, we've had our share of problems. Um, but it's always that way. Man is going to race whatever's built. One wheel, two wheels, four wheels, six. You know, it doesn't matter. Propellers. It's just going to be that way. So being a competitive person, uh, you know, you just kind of, you seem to mesh with other competitive people and then the bond grows, camaraderie grows. It, it's been a great lifetime in racing. I will say that. So I remember towards the, I don't know, maybe it wasn't even towards the end of your, of your drag boat racing career, maybe a few years before the end of it. Uh, you and I had had a conversation, and you were dead nuts serious about putting the helmet back on and climbing back inside of the capsule and, and taking that thing for a spin. And, and I often thought to myself, here's a guy that drove at one point, and now he's he's producing literally the world's quickest and fastest boat at the time. And uh, and I'm sure at some level you thought, man, I just want to I want to know what this thing feels like for once in my life. I, I always yeah. thought it was the craziest damn thought you ever had in your in your head, but I can't okay. help but wonder if you have that same feeling towards the funny car. Have you have you thought about getting inside of that thing and giving it a whirl? Well, yeah, you know, just from a curiosity standpoint, you know, with the boat, I had built that second boat, and when I turned fifty, I decided it was time to get back into shape and fight and weight, and I thought. You know, what's, what, what I felt made me understand tuning and boats was that I actually drove them. So I understood what the drivers were going through at a certain point and um, could communicate very well with them. So I decided that, what the hell, I went down and got fitted, and I thought I would at least take a spin, get my license in the fuel boat. Because, I mean, that's got to be an incredible ride. I don't care how you slice it, zero to 3.36 seconds in a thousand feet. That's insane, you know. And then, so we had the two boats and then Daryl crashed the brand new one. So after that, I decided it was a bad idea and we were down to one boat at that point. So on to racing. The car, it's Billy's job, built for Billy. I would love to try it someday. Just to, I would just do the burnout all the way to the finish line and drive it back to the pits. I don't care about launching. <laughs> I would think the launch would be, I get the burnout part of it, don't get me wrong, but I would think the engineer <laughs> part of you would want to launch that thing. And that's really why I asked you the question, to be quite honest with you, is I would think that you would love to connect the dots with that information that comes back from Billy to tell you, you know, it, it, launched okay then it started to rattle the tires and then it you know we were able to drive through it or whatever the case may be i would think that you the engineering side of your brain would just love to be able to connect those dots 
Yeah, and I and I think it would make me a better tuner and a better crew chief, uh, knowing what it feels like in the car. Although when it shakes the tires and it knocks his teeth loose, I'm not in any hurry to try that. <laughs> yeah, the best description I ever I ever heard of tire shake was somebody. It might have been John Forrest who told me just <laughs> just picture putting your head in a in a paint shaker, and I mean it literally <laughs> is that violent, you know. Oh, there's times he gets out and he goes, can we please not do that again? And I'm saying, hey, sorry, it wasn't on purpose, you know, but you want to be fast, don't you? So talk to me about what's the future hold for for Eddie Knox? More of the same? What do you see yourself doing in, in the next year? What do you see yourself doing in the next five? Well, as with all of our racing over the years, I've always called it kind of the village effect. We have a bunch of friends that sort of just pitch in on this. I'm a bum. I don't have any money. And uh, over the years, it'll be my 31st year with Redline Oil. Imagine that. And uh, 29 years with the blower shop and with J&E and MGP and some of these companies coming on board to help out with uh, parts and pieces. Uh, a lot of friends, a lot of river friends. Old Games Boys Racing, they pitch in a bunch and Dirty Deeds. It, it kind of a lot of the boat folks went over with us. And um, I hope that we get to continue. Our first few years, we've just been gathering parts. We owned nothing car-wise. So once we, when we're getting closer on that, and then it's just a matter of going racing. You know, you don't want to drive anywhere, let alone, let's say, Seattle or or uh, Tulsa and not have enough parts to put up a good fight. And so we're at a fight, you know, the only, uh, I'll never know what these guys know. I won't live long enough. I'll never be able to spend the money to have the experience. So we're full steam ahead. You know, we're doing the reader's digest version. Yeah. Great, great stuff, man. It's been a pleasure to watch you do what you do. You're clearly switched on. It clearly makes sense to you. You're clearly a threat anytime you guys show up. And and I know for the other extremely talented and legendary tuners, they respect you immensely, and they love the fact that you bring that game. Yeah, I've made a lot of good friends out there uh, with most of the tuners as well, and uh, and they're pretty helpful. Uh, if I could say to any racer, if you want to get somewhere, check your ego at the door. Don't be afraid to ask questions. My ego does not get in the way of asking for help. And I've gotten a lot of help from a lot of good, smart people. Well, I've threatened to do this, I think, over the course of the last uh, 18 years or so. I'm not sure how long we've known each other, but started doing drag boats uh, around 2002 or so. Uh, so we'll round it off at, at 18 years or so but uh, i've been threatening to go to that damn river and i've yet to make it there once in my life i think i drove beside it one time but i want to get to that river and i want to go to that bar you go to that has all the money is it money or bras hanging down from it maybe both uh, i don't think you can have both. one without the other <laughs> <laughs> well you have to make a river trip because you'll know half the people there you know uh, tony and all the boat racers there, a lot of car racers there as well. And you got to come out and go to Sundance, go to Foxes with us. And I, I, you be my guest. I'll put you up. I got a pontoon boat. We'll just cruise, baby. Yeah, Foxes, that's the one. Uh, that's the one where I always see you there. And, uh, by the way, your relationship with your daughter is very special. I see that all the time. I see how, how proud Papa is of his, of his baby girl. And she looks like she's doing phenomenal as well. Great stuff, man. Congrats on that. Yeah, I am so blessed with the kids department. Um, fortunate to have a wonderful relationship with both my kids. Uh, Ed works on the funny car with me. And, uh, you know, he did a lot of service in the Navy. And now he's a policeman. So that scares the hell out of me. Uh, Amanda has always been there to with the boat racing and supporting her dad. And she'll get in there and build some cylinder heads, get dirty. My son can build an entire funny car, you know, so I am so blessed. And I have other friends that get the opportunity to race with their family. It's amazing. Thanks a lot for your time, man. I always enjoy talking to you. I always learn something whenever I'm around you. And uh, it's, been a, it's been an incredible run to watch you do what you do. Thanks for the memories. Thanks for all of the uh, those golden passes inside of that boat. Oh, my goodness, man. Just 
absolutely impossible to explain to people what that monster was capable of doing. You have to watch it and to watch it in person and listen to that thing sing. Watching it drop literally a quarter mile of rooster tail as the water fell fell back down. I mean, it, it's just, oh my goodness, just absolutely astounding. Well, thank you. It's been a great time being your friend, working with you in the racing industry. And uh, hey, let's get some TV on these funny cars and we'll talk some more, huh? Yeah, you know what? Uh, there's a phone call coming to you here just as soon as we hang up. We should talk about that for sure, man. Perfect. Best of luck in 2022. Hope you have a great season. All right. Thanks, man. Happy New Year. Same to you. Thanks for being with us here on The Skinny. This episode has been brought to you by Toyota, Rhino Classifies, Dream Giveaway, and General Tire. For the latest in sunglasses, optical frames, accessories, and apparel, be sure to check out fatheads.com. That's fatheads with a Z. Production facilities provided by Fatheads Eyewear Studios. All rights reserved.